Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Good morning. How Hello. are you? Good afternoon. I should say good evening. Man, okay, I'm all over. Get it right one of these times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sooner or later, I'm going to nail it. Right. Let's get rid of that. Now, what one. you're doing is you're acknowledging the fact that we now have an international audience. So all three of the things that you said are correct. Yeah, Nemo and uh, and uh, oh man, Peter Bleakley are probably watching. So uh, we'll include them and all the folks that are over on that side of the water. I think it's after midnight in jolly old so i picture nemo cuddled up with uh i don't know a teddy bear and in his jammies most likely yeah he all curled up yeah uh how's life treating you arkham better than i deserve my friend i've been working tirelessly the past couple of days to try and take what carrie shirts aka the backyard professor and i did on sunday night and making it uh hopefully edited to a point where it's ready to go up on Radio Free Mormon. I'm not there yet. I will tell you that I put in at least five hours so far because that episode requires a lot of editing. And it was two hours and 38 minutes. I've got it down to, uh, I think I've cut off a lot half an hour. Down to 11 minutes. No, it's not quite that good. <laughs> not that much editing. I think it's going to be great. I think it was great Sunday night. I think it's going to even be better once the editing is done. Awesome. I'm, I'm excited to, to see that conversation. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet, but maybe I'll wait for the audio version. Um, but man, to have the two of you guys kind of going back and forth on some stuff, that's got to be some good content. Well, we had a lot of fun. At least I did. I think he did too. Good, good. Uh, anything else before we jump into the topic? Not a thing. Okay. Everybody uh, grateful for everybody who watches the show. Please hit the subscribe button or the notification bell if you want to get uh, notifications that uh, when we do uh, release content on this channel. And folks, if you'll uh, hit the like button as well where you can and share this uh, episode to, to help us get some some publicity for it. So without further ado, no Except for this a little bit of further ado, I know there's a, a perennial interest in what t-shirts I'm wearing from week to week. Yeah, uh, I've got a green T-shirt on. You may have thought this was my Zelensky T-shirt. Actually, it is my Zelensky T-shirt. What most people don't know is that Zelensky has Hela, sister of Thor, on his T-shirt, just like I do. Look at that. And I even have it signed by Zelensky. That didn't cost me a lot either. I have a T-shirt. I can't rep with the, with the mic in the way, but this was the one that was sent in. So it says Mormonism Live, and I can't really stand up, but here's the rest of it. You're muted. <laughs> <laughs> just just had to come in. <laughs> we do that to each other quite a bit, RFM. Yeah, what the audience says and knows, we've done that actually on purpose over time to make it a tagline. Yeah, yeah, we like it. We're Now we're, now we're making uh, money fist in hand, I guess, to, uh, each time we uh, we sell a shirt now with that saying. Uh, How many times have I been talking with someone and I wish I could just say, you're muted? <laughs> I think that's what Alma said. I think that's what Alma said to Corey Hoare at the end of their exchange. You're muted. <laughs> You're muted. <laughs> uh, raise the square. Uh, and just a little shirt thing. Folks are going to notice my shirt is open quite a bit. If I go one more button up, you know, like I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so my only option is to be, you know, a little bit more open. So, folks, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but anyway, there's that. This right, is without, the sexy bill instead of the Urkel bill. You got it. Let's go with sexy bill. And without further ado, let's bring our guest on. It is Thomas Murphy. Thomas, how are you? I'm doing very good. Uh, great to be back on Mormonism Live. Yeah, we're loving it, my friend. Uh, we used some of your research two weeks ago. We did an episode on the third convention. And uh, I've seen the PowerPoint that we're going to be talking about tonight. I went through each of the slides trying to get kind of a, a grasp of some of the territory that you wanted to go into. 
And uh, I'd want to start off maybe the conversation with your thoughts on that episode two weeks ago, um, because you said you were in the audience watching and kind of wanted to get a feel for what your thoughts were about it. And uh, that'll probably segue into what we're missing and we can start that conversation. Yeah. And, and actually, you can go ahead and bring the slides up because that's in the, the first uh, the first couple of slides. Yeah, so let's do that. I, I do want to point out to the, the viewers and and listeners that I've made a copy of my slides available on my academia author page. That's uh, edcc.academia.edu slash Thomas Murphy. Uh, and under presentations, you can find uh, today's presentation. Uh, and so that the, the slideshow is designed to enable you to, to follow the, the links uh, and go a little bit deeper and designed to, to help people that are interested in this topic uh, to learn a little more. Yeah, really yeah. quick too. Maven, if you don't mind, um, I don't know if you can either, Thomas, I just, if we go to the next slide, that link's going to disappear. But Maven, if you could put that link maybe into the comments for folks, that would be helpful. Um, look at that. Perfect. Yeah, that's Man. the direct link. Thanks. She's good. All right. Yeah. So I, I think last week I really enjoyed the show, uh, except that early start kind of caught me off guard. Uh, and <laughs> sorry about that. I had to leave for Florida and I had a plane to catch uh, and we had to do it. So I, I apologize. I thought I was showing up early and I was late. No, no, no. Uh, but yeah. The, My bad. Oh, you're, guess what, RFM? You're muted. <laughs> well, dang. And it was such a funny line, too. I was going to say, <laughs> that's the story of my life, yeah. thinking I'm really enjoying up late. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a good overview of some of the history relating to the third convention. And for those in the in, in the audience, you know, the third that may not have watched the show last week, the third convention was a schism in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Mexico that occurred in 1937. Uh, when about a third of the Mexican saints uh, left the church. Uh, so it's quite a significant component of the L LDS history. Uh, and I think you did a really good job of kind of talking about the people involved, uh, kind of the historical facts, uh, those aspects of it, uh, which makes my job easier because now I can kind of look at the big picture uh, and, and draw upon the, the larger issues. So I do encourage uh, listeners to go back and, and, and watch that if you haven't. Uh, and I, uh, and, and it did, you know, did a, did a great job. Uh, your pronunciation bill. Well, <laughs> uh, on that, I me. won't say too much because I probably will mess up a few myself. So Professor Murphy, I've got a question for you. Where exactly in Mexico is Jalisco? Jalisco. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I get picked on for the simple ones like uh, Brigham Young, which I said for years, bring them because before I was Mormon, the only thing I knew about Mormons was the joke about Brigham Young University. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of and so it was been a bad habit to break. But I did take two years of Spanish, barely passed those two years. And uh, I certainly have no business uh, speaking any sort of Spanish at all. Now, one thing I learned about being a, a scholar, you know, somebody who reads a lot, you know, a lot of times when you're reading, you just, you make up for yourself the pronunciations you don't know. And, yeah. Uh, that can lead to some interesting, uh, interesting takes. But uh, anyway, I'm kind of, kind of my, more of a critique is more, it's more of a critique of not necessarily your show, but your main source, uh, which was F. Lamont told us, I, uh, and, he share he shares in his book Mormons in Mexico and in the article uh, you drew heavily from a shepherd to Mexico Saints Arwell L Pierce and the third convention that was in BYU studies he tells a story of rupture and healing uh, but so that you know that you have the story of the LDS Church has this challenge that it as a young church it goes through uh, and it breaks apart but uh, by 1946, uh, especially through the leadership of Arwell Pierce, uh, who embodies the values of the church, that the church is able to come back together as a whole unit and, and reunify. Uh, the problem with that narrative is that it's partial. It's an incomplete story. Uh, and to make that narrative work, the third convention itself needs to 
fade away. It needs to disappear. It can't still be with us as a festering wound. Uh, instead, it, it, it has to fade out into the background. But wow. there's another story to to tell, or better yet, multiple stories, and indigenous ones, in which the third convention and the issues it raises are still with us today. And that's what I'm gonna 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 argue in in my presentation here. Love it. Uh, and another key issue I want to emphasize is whether or not the Book of Mormon is more of a settler colonial or a decolonizing text. That's going to be a theme that, that's running it throughout it, because what one of the things that inspired my interest in this work was how do indigenous people read the Book of Mormon? I do, do indigenous readers simply internalize the racism that's in the text or do they take the, the counter narrative uh, that uh, challenges that racism passages that say all are alike unto God, for example, or that predict that the future uh, of the church is the that Lamanites will lead in the in the future of the church or that depict uh, in its prophecies the people of the United States as Gentiles uh, and the indigenous people uh, as the chosen people. And, you know, so which way are indigenous readers going to approach the text? Uh, and that's been a key interest of mine. Sweet. I, I, I want to kind of save, I've got questions. I'll make notes here as we're talking, but I really want to kind of facilitate you being able to cover as much of this material as possible. So, okay. uh, so feel free to like, take it wherever you want to. All right. All right. I, I will roll with it. And then I was going to say that you're saying that this author, F. Lamont Tullis, had this apparent, uh, I'll just say, agenda or mm -hmm. conclusion already in, head, in, ha in hand that he was going to write about this rupture in the church in 1937, but he wants it to be healed over. But my understanding is, is that your research has shown that that conclusion of it being healed over isn't necessarily true. Is that right? Exactly. You've nailed it right there. And you know, and I, I should put, provide a little context uh, for what Tolis was doing. So Tolis was part of that team of historians that were working under Leonard Arrington in the church history, uh, the, the church history office. And they were hoping to produce a sesquicentennial history of the church that was truth telling and broad and encompassing and international in scope. Uh, and Tolis was assigned the task of, of producing the, the history uh, of Mexico. And uh, for the, the Leonard Arrington runs into a little bit of trouble uh, with the church uh, leadership. Uh, he gets kind of demoted from church historian and shifted to BYU. Uh, and this set of volumes of church history that were going to be produced uh, get scuttled. Uh, and so then here, uh, people like Lamont Tolis and several other uh, authors had produced a lot of material and they didn't know quite what to do with it. Their publishing routes were, were killed. Uh, and so he uh, turned, he doesn't name the publisher he initially turned to. He just says a prominent publisher in, in Utah. Uh, and that publisher did not want to publish the book because it talked about ethnic schism and ethnic conflict. Uh, and so he turned instead to Utah State University Press uh, and was able to publish it in 1987 uh, and including that story. So even the way he told the story that kind of minimizes some of the, the problems, uh, that was too controversial for at least one main mainstream LDS uh, facing uh, press that just wouldn't go that way. Uh, we would presume that was Deseret yeah, publishing, wouldn't we? That that was that's my guess. Or Bookcraft, which I think is a subset of Deseret. You know. Yeah, Bookcraft is the one that's not owned by the church. Oh, is that okay? Yeah, but it, it in one of those likely, but they they didn't want to touch it, but a university press did, and so we got to credit him for at least telling a very difficult story. And I want to start my critique of him with a, with a, by just by reading a selection uh, from a review I did of his work 
uh, actually a, a second edition of the, his book uh, that I published in the Journal of Mormon History in, in 2002. And I'll just read that uh, for the audience here. By the way, they call it they call it book craft because priestcraft would be too obvious. <laughs> yeah, right. While Tolis makes an effort to present a balanced portrait of ethnic conflict in the LDS Church in Mexico, he occasionally deviates from this objective. Tolis emphasizes the inexperience, development, and progress of Mexican leaders, but not the corresponding inexperience, development, and progress of Anglo-American missionaries in Mexico. For example, by 1913. Some Mormons in Central Mexico may have had as many as 25 years of experience in the church. And in a church in which most leadership is inexperienced, it seems a bit unfair to single out the development of Mexican leadership and ignore the similar inexperience of Anglo-American missionaries, several of whom had been adults for less time than many Mexicans had been members of the church. In a more balanced moment, Tolis criticizes the missionaries for their zealous focus on record keeping while overlooking the Mexican leadership's ability to effectively construct buildings, conduct meetings, and attend to the spiritual needs of their members. Tolis perpetuates American ethnocentrism even when he attempts to challenge it. His analysis of the contribution of Mexican nationalism to the ethnic conflict that culminated in the formation of a schismatic group known as the Third Convention from 1937 to 46 needs to be balanced by similar attention to the impact of nationalism and racism in the United States upon the attitudes of church leaders and missionaries. In his discussion of the first of three conventions that eventually led to a schism, Tolis notes that the Mexicans request for a mission president of their own nationality amid laws disenfranchising foreign clerics seemed rational, yet beneath the surface ran a strong current of emotion that made, in his words, Mexican saints sensitive, one might say even touchy. Uh, he refers to Mexicans' wounded pride, calls them defensive and sensitive, rebellious and angry, and depicts them as pricked by ethnic pride and their own declining leadership opportunities. Meanwhile, Tolis characterizes Anglo-American Harold W. Pratt's severe trials as a mission president as both unfortunate and unjust, so that he portrays Pratt as being treated uh, unfairly. Tolis not only overlooks the impact of American racism and nationalism, he even appears to deny any nationalistic attitudes among North American Mormons. That's a self-effacing lie, right? The missionaries from the United States were reportedly unfamiliar with nationalism, had to overcome the suspicion, distrust, and prejudice of Mexican saints. A more balanced perspective would have considered the equally urgent need for inexperienced missionaries to overcome their own suspicion and prejudice against Mexicans as they developed and progressed as missionaries. Instead of forthrightly addressing North American prejudice against Mexicans, Tolis says the first presidency was reluctant to select Mexican leadership for the mission in 1936 because the Mexican church was comparatively youthful. Tolis suggests that Isaias Juarez, president of the mission's Mexican district, who allied himself with Harold W. Pratt over the third convention, probably understood the church's traditional position of sending in outsiders where the faith is young. This might seem like a logical explanation until one takes a closer look, closer look, or let's say does the math, right? 57 years from 1879 to 1936 of local practice and growth in central Mexico amid tremendous challenges like the insufficient translation of scriptures, minimal support for building construction, multiple withdrawals of missionaries, the Mexican revolution and the Cristero rebellion made the Mexican saints stalwart and seasoned practitioners of the gospel even Tolis acknowledges later that the leaders of the Third Convention were, in his words, experienced and dedicated Mormon officials. The charges of paternalism and second-class treatment in the church advanced by Convencionistas remain far better explanations for the conflict than Tolis' suggestion that the faith was young in Mexico. Yeah, I get the idea when you read that, Professor, that the reason for this slant, which I think you've done a good job of documenting here, toward the Anglos and American Mormons versus the uh, the Mexican Mormons is that um, because of what happened, right? Because they separated themselves from the church. Therefore, the fault has to be with them. <laughs> right. Rather than uh, the LDS church leaders not following the law in Mexico, right? Yeah. I, which, you know, yeah. <laughs> there, there's multiple ways to look at it. I think that's the point that I want to make is that 
there are multiple perspectives. There's more than one way to tell this story. And Tolis, you know, does a reasonable job for uh, predominantly uh, Euro-American audience, uh, but it 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 share shows that framing rather than one that would be more sensitive to the needs and concerns of of Mexicans. I don't mean to take you off of where you're going yeah. right now, Professor, but I do have a question for you. When sure. Bill came up with this story and this idea for the podcast, I had never heard of this story before. Mm -hmm. I've been a member for 40 years, certainly never heard of it in church, never heard of it in any of my studies. I was happy to find out that it does get mentioned and with some detail in the third volume of Saints that just came out. Mm -hmm. But I had never heard of it before. Do you have any idea why that might be? Well, it's your own fault for not looking. That's what I think. <laughs> Apparently. I'm just thinking that I'm not the only one in this boat, and I'm asking on behalf of all the other ignorant people. What's the of the Illuminati? Right. The ignoranti? It was always there. We weren't hiding anything, right? Uh, uh, you know, that's where that the story of what happened with Leonard Arrington is important because I, you know, I, it's hard to say they were deliberately hiding per se, but they certainly weren't sharing it widely. Right. And, you know, the refusal of some publishers even to share the story as it's uh, whitewashed by uh, Lamont Tolis uh, shows that, you know, there, there is a protection of information. There's this culture of, limited sharing in the LDS church. And uh, this is a hard story to deal with. So it's one I obviously that's not emphasized. Yeah, it's almost like the church doesn't want to tell a story about a group of saints becoming disaffected from the church just right. because somebody else might get an idea out of that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, my interest in uh, in in this story of the third convention happened when I first read uh, Lamont Tolis's Mormons in Mexico uh, while conducting ethnographic uh, research with Latter-day Saints in Antigua, Guatemala during the summer of 1993. And for those not familiar with anthropology, uh, ethnographic research is our main research methodology, especially in cultural anthropology. And for that research methodology, you, you spend time living in a community that you're studying uh, and so I spent uh, three months in Antigua uh, working with Latter-day Saints. Uh, the, the funding for my research was for health-related research. Uh, and so it was really focused on the word of wisdom. But that's not what the, the people in Guatemala wanted to talk about. They wanted to talk about uh, ethnic issues. They wanted to talk about the Popo Vu. Uh, they had other things they wanted to talk about. And so... I produced two articles as a base of that research, one in the Journal for the Scientific Study of Religion on the health-based research. And then this article I pictured in the, the slides here, Reinventing Mormonism in Guatemala as, the harbing, as a harbinger of the future. And what really struck me uh, was that I, what I was reading about in Tolis's book was happening right before my eyes in Guatemala. Uh, I was in a priesthood uh, session uh, with, you know, just a regular priesthood session, the local Antigua ward I was visiting, uh, and uh, a member of the the ward that I use a pseudonym for, Luis, is the pseudonym I came up with, uh, pointed to me and said uh, that there was a difference between Guatemalan Mormons and Anglo Mormons, the term he used, uh, and uh, he said that us Anglos were gentiles or Gentiles, uh, and uh, we were adopted into uh, the covenant of Abraham, uh, while Guatemalan saints of indigenous heritage uh, were direct descendants of Abraham. Uh, and that was a claim that had been at, at, at the center of the, the controversy in the Third Convention, and later with uh, George P. Lee, uh, Navajo General Authority, uh, and so I wrote this article, did kind of a comparison between what I was observing in Guatemala in the 1990s, what had happened in Mexico in the 1930s, and what had happened in the uh, Navajo Nation in the 1980s. And uh, showing that what kind of 
the tensions underlying what happened in the third convention are not gone. They're still with us. Uh, and as I'll argue later, they're, they're in part uh, kept alive uh, by the Book of Mormon itself. Uh, well, that's what I was going to mention was that it sounds like Louise, mm -hmm. as well as George P. Lee, that their main problem was reading the Book of Mormon too closely. Exactly. The Book, exactly. Of, <laughs> the Book of Mormon gives primacy of place in the latter days to the Lamanites and the Gentiles, which means the non Lamanite Mormons, the ones who convert to Mormonism, have a second place status. And when you couple that with the early church, I won't even say early church, I'll say when I joined the church 40 years ago, their insistence that they knew who the Lamanites were. And it's basically everybody who was here, who was a native, then you start running into people who are natives, Native Americans saying, okay, we're Lamanites, we're reading the Book of Mormon, we have primacy of place in the Book of Mormon. So how come the church that is based upon the Book of Mormon isn't reflecting that? And it even goes further than that, RFM, which is that early leaders, there are quotes on the record where the Lamanites shall build the temple in the New Jerusalem. There, There's all this rhetoric among the uh, early leadership in the Restoration that also places this uh, importance of hierarchy on the Lamanites and their role in the Restoration, that it's not just the Book of Mormon. It is the entire theology of early Mormonism. Yes, right, it's and, not and, just the Book of Mormon. It's Jesus. <laughs> it's in one of those chapters we don't talk about where right. Jesus is telling the Lamanites, you're going to build the temple. Gentiles, they'll help. You know, they'll carry your, your supplies, presumably, and help you out. But you are going to be the ones, the Lamanites, who are going to be building the temple in the city of Zion in the last days. Yeah. Yeah. And what I was finding is that indigenous readers of the Book of Mormon were quick to key in on those passages. Uh, and, you know, I mean, essentially, the Book of Mormon read carefully uh, predicts the failure of the Gentiles uh, and the ascendancy of the descendants of the Lamanites. Uh, and so that anticipation is present within the text. Well, kind of going back to to my story a little bit, uh, I after after doing that work in in Guatemala, I, at that time I'd been an undergraduate at the University of Iowa. Uh, and I did that research in the summer of 1993. Then I enrolled in a PhD program in sociocultural anthropology at the University of Washington the next year, 1994. You lazy lawyer, uh, you. And <laughs> I, I proposed in my application to graduate school to do work on the third convention as my, uh, as, mm. as my, the focus of my PhD. Uh, and I had had a long standing interest in Mexico, not just from reading Lamont Tolis, but uh, stories in my family uh, of a paternal grandfather, my my dad's dad, uh, and my paternal great grandparents, uh, who had settled in Oaxaca, uh, Mexico, uh, during the Porfiriato, which was uh, the dictatorship that preceded the Mexican Revolution. Run uh, Por uh, Porfirio Diaz was the president from 1876 to 1880, and then again from 1880 to 1911, and he ruled with a with an iron fist. Uh, but he was very receptive to bringing in people from the United States uh, and settling in not just northern Mexico, uh, where the Mormons settled, but also in southern Mexico, where my ancestors settled. Uh, and so it was Porfiri Porfirio Diaz who had invited the Mormons uh, to take refuge in northern Mexico uh, during when the when the LD, or the United States was uh, trying to suppress uh, the practice of plural marriage, and so. Uh, Latter-day Saints were moving, you know, actually said at least about 4,000 uh, Latter-day Saints moved to Mexico, founded a, a, a string of colonies from in Chihuahua and Sonora, and, uh, and were building this large uh, Euro-American presence in northern Mexico. Well, the same thing was happening in southern Mexico as well. Actually, where, anywhere the railroads ran, uh, Porfirio Diaz had this, this scheme going on where uh, he was giving away land to railroad c companies in order to build railroads. We actually did the same thing in the U.S. Uh, and then they, the railroad companies would make their profits by selling the land to speculators. And uh, my family got caught up in that. They were up here in, in the state of Washington. And uh, 
saw advertisements for buying a banana plantation in southern Mexico, and I and went off on this get rich scheme that turned out to be a, a bit of a fraud. Uh, and they uh, they get down to Oaxaca, and they find out that well there were already people living on the land that they bought from the speculators. Uh, the government had given away the land without clearing it with the indigenous mm -hmm. people. Uh, and so that made a quite a, 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 a significant tension uh, in this community. Uh, in, at the time, they called that community, uh, uh, what did they call it? Uh, I'm blanking on the, the name. Anyway, I, I, I'd been raised with this story and was curious about it. And so... Uh, I was quite interested in Oaxaca in southern Mexico as well, not just uh, what's going on with the third convention. And during the summer of 1996, I had the opportunity to work in Oaxaca on the, the Zapotec Ethnobiology Project as a research assistant under my professor, uh, Dr. Eugene Hun from the University of Washington. And this was a study of the relationships between people, plants, and animals uh, in a remote Zapotec community in the Sierra Madre Mountains of southern Mexico. Uh, which coincidentally I should note is the place where John Sorensen, uh, or at least part of the place where John Sorensen argues that the Book of Mormon occurred uh, in, near the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. Right. Uh, but I was in basically in Oaxaca doing this research, had nothing to do with Mormonism. Uh, and uh, I got a weekend break. And during that weekend break, it was a long weekend uh one, my, one of the other research assistants was coming back to the States for a wedding, uh, and our professor was, I don't even remember what he was doing, uh, but we had a long, long weekend that, that I had off. And so I thought, why don't I go to Osumba? Uh, and I, so I headed, I jumped on a bus and headed to Osumba in central Mexico. So Oaxaca is southern Mexico, and uh, Osumba is in the state of Mexico, which is near Mexico City in central Mexico. Uh, and I, I took a bus, and I just showed up unannounced in this community of Osumba uh, and looking for relatives of Margarito Bautista. I, I, I didn't expect that I would necessarily find any because Tolis had told me in 1994 that he didn't think that Bautista's community still existed. Uh, and the Mexican historian Agricola Ozano Herrera had claimed that the colony had almost disappeared uh, after Margarito Bautista's death in 1961. And so what I had expected to find was maybe a straggler or two, somebody who remembered Margarito Bautista or maybe some relatives or somebody that had been involved that was still around. And what I found was uh, quite different. Uh, and I would return in the winter, summer, and fall of 97 to mark the 50th anniversary of this community that I encountered there. I, and I also went to school at El Colegio de Mexico. There was a program for people with Mexican heritage to, to go to school in Mexico, and they considered my Anglo ancestors to count for that. Uh, and so I'd been, I went to school that summer in 97 in Mexico City, and I'd spend my weekends as much as possible in Osumba. And then I was in Mexico City again in 97 for a, an American Society for Ethnic History meeting. So I had quite a bit of chances to, to interact over a couple of years uh, with this community in Osumba. And so I want to share with you a little bit of what I found. Uh, and you shared a Wikipedia version of that uh, last week. So uh, I, I would love to hear what you what you found. Uh, I just wanted to note that I think it's it's either Bill or it's Maven. It's one of the three of us other than me, who's been putting up quotes from the Book of Mormon and other church leaders about the role of the Lamanites in building the temple in the last it's days. It's me, RFM. Yeah. Okay. It's not Maven. It's Bill. And uh, I looked up one too. This is the one I remember. This is actually how I found out. No, this isn't how I found out about it. But um, I had come to that conclusion myself from reading the Book of Mormon, mm -hmm. just straight reading the Book of Mormon. But then Bruce R. McConkie had something to say about this. In his last work, which was a new witness for, what was it? A new witness for the Articles of Faith. I think that's what it was, page 519. Here's what he says. Now, of course, he was also thinking of this, not just from the 1930s. He was thinking about it from George P. Lee as well, I'm sure. 
when he wrote in disagreeing with what the Book of Mormon says on the subject, <laughs> he says, an occasional whiff of nonsense goes around the church acclaiming that the Lamanites will build the temple in the New Jerusalem and that Ephraim and others will come to their assistance. I don't think Ephraim's mentioned in there. I think it's Gentiles. But anyway, and that Ephraim and others will come to their assistance. This illusion is born of an inordinate love for Father Lehi's children and of a desire to see them all become now as Samuel the Lamanite once was. The Book of Mormon passages upon which it is thought to rest have reference not to the Lamanites, but to the whole house of Israel. The temple in Jackson County will be built by Ephraim, baby, Ephraim, meaning the church as it is now constituted with white guys at the head. This is where the keys of temple building are vested, and it will be to this Ephraim that all the other tribes, including you pesky Lamanites, will come in due course to receive their temple blessings, period, end of quote. And I hope the audience can figure out where it was that I was adding my own comments to those of Bruce R. McConkie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's a tension that's there, and the, it's going to be there as long as we read the Book of Mormon. Uh, that's that's the challenge the church has. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so what I found in, in Osumba was a thriving community uh, that called themselves Colonia Industrial uh, that's located... so. Colonia Industrial is like a town and Osumba is like a county, to put it in kind of U.S. perspective. Uh, and they had a different story to tell than Tolis had to tell. In fact, they described themselves as stronger than ever. Uh, and they took pride in living pro marriage in the United Order. They'd even built their own temple or an endowment house, depending on who I talked to. I, they use different terms for that. But basically... Can I ask you something, Professor Murphy? Yeah. This is a change, right? Back in the 1930s, they're part of the church, but it's the 1930s. They're not practicing plural marriage in Mexico, are they? Ah, see that good question. Uh, so some of the, the, the third convention itself, I, the, the bulk of the people there, well, okay. There, there was plural marriage was occurring, you know, up till, uh, 1890 and then there was post manifesto polygamy also occurring okay so most of the the like the missionaries and stuff i think bill did a good job of pointing this out were coming from those polygamous families uh so they were still polygamous church leaders were still polygamous in 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 the 1910s and 1920s 1930s uh and so there was still polygamy in one sense but they weren't supposed to be practicing new polygamy. So there was in that transitional period between the manifesto uh, and the, the what they call the first, the second, and the third manifesto. So the first manifesto in 1890, the, the second one in 1904, the third one in sometime in the 1930s. I don't remember the exact date. It, it'd, uh, be, it'd be fair to say that you know, Utah is in the middle of trying to distance itself from polygamy, but it sent a significant number of saints down to Mexico to continue the principle. And that the Mexican saints growing up in that area with these uh, Anglo uh, Mexican or uh, Anglo church members who were sent to continue polygamy, the the idea about polygamy and whether it was approved or not, that would have had a very different appearance to the Mexican saints than it did to the saints in Utah. Yeah, well, the key person in this was Margarito Bautista. So Margarito Bautista, he was from uh, Osumba, but he, uh, after he, he joined the church in 1901, uh, Bill kind of shared his story last a uh, couple of weeks ago, uh, and he went up later to live in the colonies in northern Mexico. So he was interacting with all these people that were still practicing polygamy. Then he went to Utah during the Mexican Revolution he spent mo most of the Mexican Revolution living in Utah, where he was still connected with uh, people that were initially practicing polygamy under direction of the church. But over time, that direction started to move away. Uh, but he was heavily involved with the people that would that would found the fundamentalist uh, churches. Uh, and so... Bautista comes back to central Mexico after the revolution. He, or he does a, a mission there. And one of, one of his, 
uh, descendant. So, I mean, I don't, I'll share this story because she contacted me on Facebook. This, this woman who uh, claims to be a granddaughter of Margarito Bautista. And she said that I, her mom had hooked up with Margarito Bautista when he was on his mission in the 1920s in, in central Mexico. And uh, that, you know, she basically was a, a granddaughter uh, of this polygamous relationship that was occurring in the 1920s. Uh, and so basically Bautista himself, if she, if she's telling the story correctly, was uh, never stopped. I mean, he was practicing polygamy in the 1920s. When he comes back in the 1930s to central Mexico, he ends up in a disagreement with some of the other members of the third convention over whether or not the LDS church was apostate for abandoning polygamy uh, and plural marriage. Uh, and so what happens af after the third convention itself and its leaders are excommunicated, uh, there is a further division in the third convention between those who supported uh, plural marriage and uh, communal living or the United Order. And they started their own separate groups. Uh, and uh, one of those was the group uh, started by Margarito Bautista. And he founded in, in 1947. So this is after the, the reunification in, in 46. He founds a community called Colonia Industrial in, in Osumba uh, that makes their central practice, one of, one of the distinctive practices they emphasize is the return of plural marriage in the United Order. Uh, and so in that sense, they are aligned with and even allied with uh, fundamentalist movements in the United States. They By the time I came there in 1997, they were affiliated with the Apostolic United Brethren or the AUB. Uh, and in fact, that temple, when I talked to scholars like Christina Rossetti, who's a scholar of the fundamentalist Mormons, she refers to this temple that I have showing on the slide as the, the AUB temple. Uh, and I uh, built kind of initially in secret down in Osumba. Uh, and I basically there's communities quite thriving, but they are, they're, they're on, uh, they aren't making a big scene for themselves. Uh, and certainly they were well known in fundamentalist communities. They were well known among people in central Mexico, uh, but not to scholars in the United States. They'd largely been written out of the history by Agricola Lozano and, and Ethel Montolas. Are there I, I any other pictures of this temple yeah. that you're aware of other than the one that you took and that we're looking at right now on the screen? Yeah, you know, I was beforehand here. Well, while I was in uh, at Claremont Graduate University this last summer, participating in a seminar on Mormonism in Mexico, some of the younger scholars there we were talking about, I've shown them this picture of the temple, and they pulled it up on Google Street View. Uh, and I, so I was playing around with that a little bit. It's a little tricky to find it on Google Street View. I was playing around with that a little bit earlier today. You can still see it there. It's, it's still there. Uh, you can see in my picture that there's some there's still some construction going on on the outside in the grounds. I'm not sure what year the temple was built. Uh, whenever, when I started asking them questions about the, the temple, they, they avoided those questions. They didn't really want to uh, answer them. They didn't want to talk about it. So I didn't press. Uh, but it looks like there was still at least external construction occurring on the out uh, in 1997. Uh, and yeah, somebody's I asking. Ask if I if the temple ceremony resembles which version, I, I don't know the answer to that question because, like I said, I didn't ask them a lot of questions. My suspicion I, is that they followed the line of other AUB folks and uh, tried to restore the older versions. That's my suspicion, but I can't say that with 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 confidence. That building, the picture I'm looking at of the temple has mm -hmm. many, many places where it looks like there used to be windows, both circular and with an arch that have been bricked up. Do you think that's part of the original architecture or do you think that there were actually windows there that then they took care of putting bricks in to maintain privacy within? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I've puzzled over that myself too because it does appear kind of closed off. Uh, and it looks like when I looked at the Google Street View, it looked similar. 
to that now. So uh, I really I wonder if they bought a building that was already constructed and then modified it. Mm, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Um, okay. Another question I've got here is, you know, they end up affiliating with the AUB or the group that's led by the All Reds. Yes. And do you know how the AUB got in there to have some influence or was it, it sounds like maybe what you're saying is that the, the Mexican saints um, either probably later than Batista, right? Probably after him, but the Mexican saints would have maybe reached out and said, Hey, we think, we think the LDS church is apostatized. Um, we see you guys as having, you know, a, a larger portion of the truth. And maybe that's how the connection started. I guess I'm asking, do you know the origination story of how the All Reds got their foot in the door? They were, so Margarito Bautista was what worked for some of the founders of the fundamentalist movements in the U.S., including what would become the AUB. Gotcha. Uh, so he worked for them uh, in Utah. And so he was connected before he went back to, before he went to Mexico. Yeah. Uh, and he would actually, I don't know all the details of this, I know Christina Rossetti is working on this. Anthropologist Christina Rossetti is working on this topic, but I, I, he was an apostle uh, with some of the, with the All Red branch, and that led to a division. That led to a division there. Uh, with some, some of the fundamentalists weren't willing to accept a Lamanite uh, apostle. And again, I don't, I don't know all the details of this myself, but I do know that Christina Rossetti and. Uh, and uh, Stephanie Griswold, they're doing some great research on that. I don't so know. Some research they, forthcoming. Yeah, I don't know if either of them are listening, but uh, they, there, there's a story to be told yet there. Uh, you can see in this picture, who too, there's a calle or street, Joseph Smith, Jose Smith, as they said. Uh, and here's some pictures of the, whoops, uh, here's some pictures of the, the the homes when i what really struck me in this community is is how meticulous they were in keeping the streets clean you can see that in kind of the the lower portion of that picture on on at least on my right when i'm looking at it uh and i it, it, there were vehicles at pretty much at every home and uh you know it, it's definitely more affluent than the surrounding area that i was in and and a lot cleaner in fact there were kids like cleaning sweeping the streets as part of their communal labor program uh so it it, it was it was pretty impressive sight uh this is some of the communal industry uh their water tower uh the brick making factory uh and then some of the produce from their farms i it, and the processing of that produce that was occurring when i was there in january of uh, 97. uh Persistent so is that it Oh, sorry. Is that a mountain in the background? Yeah, that's Popo, uh, Popo Catepeto, uh, or Popo, as people call it. Uh, that's the most prominent uh, volcano in, in Mexico City. Actually, it actually went off while I was there. Uh, it, 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 you know, it was just ash falling, but it was kind of, kind of freaky. Uh, yeah. That was, I think, if I remember right, when the summer that it went off when I was there in the summer, but uh, that, that they call this the region of the volcanoes. Yeah. We had something like that happen up here in Washington back in 1980. I remember that one too. Uh, <laughs> Maybe it's you. I was Where in Idaho. Know these things happen. I was oh, really, Idaho, well, you yeah. got, you got, well, the we, we had the ash you? in Pocatello. Yeah. It landed on our cars and everything. Here's some pictures of the farms. Uh, and some of the communal labor happening on the farms and the member of the bishopric taking me around to show show me the farms. Uh, but, you know, it was definitely an impressive endeavor that they had going on. It looks beautiful. I, a big group that was very, quite helpful to me at the time was the uh, El Museo de, uh, de la Historia de Mormonis, or Historia Mormona Mexicana, I think they called it. But anyways, the Museum of Mormon History in Mexico. Uh, and this was founded by Fernando Gomez and uh, Sergio Pagasa uh, out of a collection that they had gotten from their 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 aunt, uh, Consuelo. 
uh, Aunt Gomez, and she had she had collected she she'd been a part of the groups that didn't split with the third convention, but they were connected with the rest of the third convention, and she collected documents. She was a school teacher, uh, and she co collected historical documents and diaries and all sorts of materials about that early period of church history in Mexico. And then when she passed away, Fernando and Sergio inherited that collection, uh, and they decided to turn it into a museum that they opened in uh, 1991 in Mexico City across the street from the temple in Mexico City. And that's where I visited them, and they were really helpful for for my work. Uh, and I wanted to reciprocate their, their assistance, so I reviewed some of their early publications, which were mostly in Spanish in the Journal of Mormon History. Uh, for those who are following the slideshow, the, the slideshow has active links uh, under those Journal of Mormon History uh, and in the under the text uh, to those earlier reviews. And they were starting to produce their own research. But uh, Fernando says quite humbly that he's neither historian nor an archivist. Uh, and, you know, and, and certainly it, the histories are, are, are not necessarily academic in, in focus, but they're really pretty good histories. Uh, this one at the, with the orange color, the, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Lamanite Conventions, From Darkness to Light, that one they published in 2004, and it was an updated version of the ones I had reviewed in the couple of years before that. Uh, and that one they're handing out at the museum in Provo. Uh, I think they gave it to me free. I don't know if they're charging. I gave them a big donation. But people that want to learn more, I encourage you to visit their museum that's in Provo, just across the street from BYU. Uh, today, they call it the Museum of Mormon History of the Americas. Uh, and uh, anyway, they, they really were helpful in getting me going with my research projects uh, in 96 and 97. Can I jump in here for just a yeah. second? Because I think that... Yeah. You may be being a bit humble, but let me tell you what my understanding is. My understanding is that based upon prior writings, uh, was it Tullus, I think was his name? Mm -hmm. The idea was that there had been a reunification of most of the Mexican saints back in 1947, but there were still some who didn't come back and that those had basically perished and dwindled in unbelief. Exactly, yeah. That's, and that's yet, the narrative. Yes, and you went down there in 1997 and serendipitously, I believe, stumbled upon the fact that, no, they haven't perished and dwindled in unbelief. They're a thriving community that have their own temple and industrial mm -hmm. projects. Right. That's yeah, and, you know, people like Fernando and Sergio, they, they knew about Bautista and, and his community, so they were aware. So it wasn't like I, I discovered some something that local people didn't know about uh it was already, yeah, just us people up here north of the border right and and then in, in osumba you know when i uh when i asked about uh, mormons i was like oh yeah we got some of those you know and they were very aware and and you know i even talked to some latter-day saints in in osumba and they talked about bautista's group as hermanos de la fe or you know brothers and sisters in the faith uh, and so they were aware, it, local people knew what was going on. It's just, like I say, the scholars that were uninformed. Right. And I just wanted to underscore the fact that um, accidentally or not, you're the one who brought this to light and found out that the prior narrative was incorrect. Not only are they still there, they're thriving and have their own temple. Right. So, th yeah. Thanks for the, the credit, you and Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, I did write a few articles based on that research that I did. Uh, so one of them would, would be kind of a case study using the third convention as a case study uh, for how the LDS church can attract people of color while teaching that a dark skin is a curse from God. Uh, you know, that seemed to me like a, significant challenge. Uh, yet the fact that the church was growing in Mexico and even doing quite well 
meant that something had to be happening. So the anthropologist in me is like, how is this possible? How is it that a church that by any objective standard is clearly racist uh, can, can attract people of color? And what I found in this case study is that Latter-day Saints employ racial and ethnic imagery instrumentally, that is, to serve particular needs at specific times and places, that people are selective uh, in, their, in, in their uses. Uh, so the, the question was, what, what is the population of the group? Uh, it was, what did they say, I think? In 1997, if I remember right, I, I think they said about 500 with a couple hundred more outside. I, but it, it was small. It was less than 1,000 at that time. Today, I, I, I'm sure it's over 1,000. Uh, but I don't, I, don't, I don't know the exact numbers. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't as big as the third convention itself, which was about 800 people. So I... Uh, that split in 1937. But anyway, that was answering a question from the chat. So what what I found in this article is that Mexican Mormons reinterpreted the racial doctrines in self-affirming manners, while Latter-day Saints had used Lamanite imagery to denigrate Native Americans, uh, to justify wars against them and to displace them. But Mexican Mormons reinterpreted those in more self-affirming manners, claiming a Lamanite identity, then centering the church's past, present, and future in Mexico. Uh, and so then the question became, well, how do how does that survive within the church? Uh, and what I what I found again using the Third Convention as a case study is that the Euro-American church leaders would tolerate diffuse interpretations as long as members don't challenge their authority. That's the rub, is when the Third Convention challenges LDS authority, that's when they try to stamp it down. That's when they try to uh, to silence it. The same thing happened with George P. Lee. But what I was observing in Guatemala, uh, they weren't they were challenging me as an as an Anglo anthropologist, uh, but they weren't challenging church leaders. They weren't directing their challenge against the mission president, uh, and so. I had no authority to to do anything, <laughs> uh, but you know the, the church leaders will tolerate that diffuse interpretation, the, those self affirming interpretations from from indigenous Mormons, so long as they they don't challenge their authority. And if they challenge the authority, that's when uh, suppression is occurring. Is there anything in your research that sheds a light on the church's growth in Africa? Because I think the Book of Mormon can definitely, I think the straightforward reading of it is very affirming to Lamanites. But I don't see any reading of the Book of Mormon that's affirming to those of African lineage. Yeah, well, there there was this guy, I forget his name, from Eritrea or, you know, what's part of, what, part of Ethiopia. He lived in the Seattle area and he had contacted me uh, several times about his interpretation. He was running for president of Eritrea. Uh, and he had some pretty wild interpretations of the Book of Mormon in terms of it occurring in Africa and that uh, Eritreans were the Lamanites. And uh, I think they had a website, too, but I, it's been a long time since I really looked at that material. And most of my interaction was directly with with some of the members uh, rather than a like a careful study. Uh, but it there's something interesting going on in in parts of Africa as well, but I don't I don't have enough to comment other than saying it needs to be studied more carefully. Yeah, I'm wondering where they're going to get a narrow neck of land anywhere in Africa. Mm, yeah, that's okay, the, I don't know. the Mormons are having trouble with that same question in the Americas anyway. Yeah, yeah. One of the commenters uh, chat said the church website says the Third Convention expelled Bautista for, for practicing polygamy. That's that's uh, not exactly right, because he was first expelled for being part of the Third Convention. The Third Convention expelled him for practicing polygamy, but the LDS Church expelled him for being part of the Third Convention. Uh, so another article that I that I wrote about this 
uh, is called Other Mormon Histories, Lamanite Subjectivity in Mexico. And this I published in the Journal of Mormon History. I, I should say that last article I, I published in uh, a journal called Ethno History. It's a major anthropology journal. Uh, it's actually my most cited uh, article, um, even more than my DNA research that would come later. So it's what I'm best known for in anthropology, not in Mormon studies per se. But this one, this is my, one of my favorite articles that I did in the early years. Uh, and it uses, again, the third convention as a case study for looking at colonial bias in, in Mormon historiography. And historiography means kind of the, the, the study of writing history, right? How do we write history? Uh, and, you know, Leonard Arrington and others, you know, really had developed this new approach to history they called the new Mormon history. Uh, that tried to emphasize the perspectives of ordinary people, of ethnic minorities and women, and make them, rather than just an institutional history of the, the church as an organization, to, to emphasize those regular people. And Lamont Tolis's work was part of that effort. Uh, but as I said, he had trouble uh, dealing with, with the Third Convention story because the facts of the matter uh, don't tell us, give us comforting messages, right, as we read it. Uh, and that's more true, that's true more generally about uh, Agrico Lozano Herrera and Margarito Bautista Valencia. These were two Nahua Mormons who wrote history in their own terms. They both wrote histories. Uh, in the case of Bautista, it was a La Evolución de Mexico. And in the case of Agrico Lozano Herrera, he wrote uh, a history of Mormons in Mexico. And uh, Lozano would become the, the president of the LDS temple. He would become a stake president. So he would actually get, he would be the person that gets eventually what the church, the church members were asking for back in the 30s. He would get much later, decades later, uh, he would become that uh, Mexican stake president, Mexican temple president. Uh, and he wrote a history in Spanish uh, of early Mormonism, and Margarito Bautista Valencia wrote his story. And so what I was looking at is how do new Mormon historians deal with these writings of Lozano and Bautista? And what we've got is that both Lozano and Bautista see themselves as Lamanites. So those others of the Book of Mormon, the Lamanite others, the Book of Mormon being written from a Nephite perspective, uh, they they adopt that other as a self, as who they are, uh, and I uh, then it, again assert that identity uh, in their writings. Uh, both both of them emphasize the centrality of Mexico to Mormon history, uh, but Lozano internalized LDS racism, so. He basically accepted those white supremacist narratives, those racist narratives, where Bautista reversed it back upon the Gentiles so that the Gentiles were the evil ones. The Gentiles were the, the ones that were wicked, uh, including the LDS uh, mission president, right? Uh, they become the, the wicked ones and the LDS church itself by giving up polygamy in the United Order uh, had uh, basically abandoned the gospel uh, and left it now to Lamanites to lead in the latter days. Uh, and so that article kind of looks at the ways we tell history uh, by juxtaposing Nahua narratives with uh, that of Tolis and other uh, scholars from the New Mormon history. In last week, Oh, please, please. sorry. Last week, or not last, two weeks ago, when we talked about this topic, mm -hmm. even in faithful circles like the BYU article that we used a bunch from, it seemed as though there was, if you read between the lines and read some of the phrases and, and sentences specifically, Arwell Pierce had to go in there and essentially go in so soft. And he had to acknowledge in lots of places that the LDS church not only could have done better, but that the Mexican saints had a fair um, disagreement, that, that, that there was some things that they were right about, 
And mm -hmm. I was actually quite surprised to see kind of a faithful article from the church's side even grant that much. Yeah, and that, that's the new Mormon history approach. Uh, but the what makes, I guess what makes Lozano and Bautista even more challenging is that they don't use basic historical methodologies where uh, Tolis uses, you know, standard historical methodologies. Uh, they also tell the, the story in, in their own words, you know, in their own perspective. Uh, so how do we, how do we write about those histories? Because even their perspectives are biased, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, Anthony Campbell says, Dr. Murphy Lozano did not share this in private. He viewed the white leadership in Mexico and in the church as an insult to Lamanites. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, what, what he wrote is what I dealt with. I was looking yeah. at uh, what was in what was in print. Hmm. Uh, and I was not privy to uh, inside perspective. So thanks for sharing that. Well, anyway, to keep the story moving along, I, I before you before you move the story along, yeah, I did have a question for you because if you could give us a thumbnail of George P. Lee for those in the audience who don't know who he is and what happened to him, but just a thumbnail, because my question yeah, just, is, yeah, so he was my, the the first name. And then my American question is, and then my question is whether you think there was any influence from the third convention on George P. Lee or whether he arrived at a similar position independently from his study of the Book of Mormon? Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that second one. <laughs> okay, just go uh, with the first I, one. I wish I did. Uh, the first one, he was a Native American uh, 70, if I remember right. Uh, so he was a general authority. Uh, and uh, he rose in in leadership uh, through... Through, he'd been a member of the placement program, a, a Navajo kid who's part of the placement program. Uh, and then I went in and got a PhD at BYU in educational leadership, if I remember right. And I, uh, and then ran some schools on the reservation, eventually becomes a general authority. Uh, and I do know that what he wrote about was the, the shifting attention that church leaders were paying to saints from Latin America versus North America. And at, at the time, especially in the 1970s, there were a lot of protests against uh, uh, the church by members of the American Indian movement. Uh, and so kind of as a retaliatory aspect to, to, to that, the, the church began to really shift its attention away from the Indian placement program, the education programs that they'd established for Native people at BYU, uh, church leaders like uh, Boyd K. Packer was frustrated that Natives were coming to BYU, getting an education, going back home and doing their own thing, not staying in the LDS church. Uh, and so they were defunding uh, these uh, church programs for Native Americans and investing instead in Latin America. So that's what about what uh, George P. Lee was quite upset about. Uh, and he shared with Bautista the same sort of reading of the Book of Mormon of Lamanite leadership in the last days that uh, the Euro-American church leaders were actually Gentiles in Book of Mormon terms. Uh, he shared those points of view, whether or not he arrived at them independently or or not, I suspect probably independently from the Book of Mormon, but he may have been aware of what was going on in Mexico if he had read, for example, uh, well, Tolis's work wasn't out yet, so he wouldn't have read it. So I don't know. He, but All right, anyway, I'm sorry, I interrupted there, and you're going to your article in American Apocrypha. Yeah, so, right. So my, I'd started doing this research, and my well, my plan was to come back and do a major study that would have been several years in length, at least another, a full year there. Uh, I'd already been working on it for a couple of years, but I was in and out of Mexico. I was mostly in Washington, and I wanted to spend a long, longer period of time there. And so I applied for uh, funding from a number of sources like the National Science Foundation, the Social Science Research Council, the uh, Winter Grand Foundation. These are the types of organizations that fund long-term ethnographic studies. Uh, and uh, they were all unsuccessful. The only thing I'd been successful at was uh, some funding 
well, I gotten some small grants, but the major grants that I got was the foreign language and area studies fellowships. And those that did enable me to do that initial research, but they weren't sufficient that I could take my family uh, to Mexico with me. And so I have at home, I have a daughter and uh, a wife that I wanted to be able to go to Mexico with me. And so I needed sufficient funding uh, to do that. And I, I couldn't get it. Uh, it was just Mormon topics were not high priority in funding and anthropology. Uh, and what happened in the meantime, so I'm not getting this funding. I'm kind of delaying my dissertation a little bit. I'd actually written a first draft of my dissertation uh, and they'd asked me to, to revise it, go back. I'd done a comparative study of the Pope of Voo, Book of Mormon and Black Elk Speaks. Uh, and they asked me to go back and, and do more of this stuff with Mexico and more of a focus on Mormonism uh, and take out the Popol Vuh and Black Elk Speak stuff. And so I, I just delayed. And while I was delaying, uh, I'd gotten a job at Edmonds Community College and was putting a lot of energy into that. And I get an unsolicited offer of funding from Brent Metcalf in 2001 to write an article on DNA in the Book of Mormon. And that would take my career in a very different direction. Uh, Brent is such a bad influence. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I met Brent, I think, through like uh, Sunstone and Mormon L and a few other. Uh, Mormon L was like a listserv that a lot of us were on back in the day. Uh, and I, I wrote this article. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Lamanite Genesis, Genealogy and Genetics. Uh, but to say that that really derailed my Mexico work. Uh, unintentionally. Uh, and I did want to note that today, Thanksgiving Eve, marks the 20th anniversary of the initiation of disciplinary proceedings against me by my state president for publication of that article in American Apocrypha that was edited by Dan and Brent. Yes, Dan uh, Vogel just made a comment in the live chat saying that this was the article that put you on the farm's hit list. <laughs> yes. And, you know, that that actually turned out to be a little bit traumatic for me personally, too. You know, it's, I, it's like I was doing this research that uh, initially the, the stuff on Mexico was getting great reception. This one, not so great. Uh, and, you know, lots of pushback, uh, lots of hostile attacks. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, I was doing quite well in my other work. I had this great job at Edmonds Community College. And that ended up taking my career in yet another direction. So from about 2005 to 2015, I decided to take a long break from Mormon studies. I'd had enough about ar arguing over DNA in the Book of Mormon. I think I'd won the argument and, <laughs> and <laughs> weren't willing to accept that. <laughs> Although the church finally did. They changed the introduction of the Book of Mormon and so on. So they did. But uh, anyway, I took a long break. I had no trouble getting funding from uh, for the other work I was doing, like I had over well over a million dollars worth of grants from Learn to Serve America and the NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the EPA, tribes, and many others. And I basically focused my scholarship and attention on an environmental anthropology field school uh, that I developed in partnership with Coast Salish nations of Western Washington and British Columbia and Canada. So instead of becoming a, a scholar of Mexico, well, I, I was a scholar of Mexico, but uh, I kind of let that lay aside and my Spanish kind of floundered a little bit. And I became a affiliate faculty in Canadian studies at the University of Washington rather than Mexican studies. I, and I would take students on a uh, tribal canoe journey, for example, up to BC to places like Bella Bella and uh, work with local tribes on environmental knowledge. So it was a lot of fun. We evaluated, restored and evaluated and restored salmon and shellfish habitat. We worked with traditional foods, tracked and monitored wildlife, built ethnobotanical gardens and trails and hosted salmon festivals and powwows. And, you know, it was a great break from Mormonism. Uh, but I decided- is there, such a thing a, is there such a thing as a bad break from Mormonism? <laughs> uh, yeah, there can be, I suppose. But, you know- <laughs> I suppose so. By the way, before you go on, yeah. I really want to underscore once again for the one member possibly of the audience who doesn't know that your article in American Apocrypha about DNA and the genetics related to the Lamanites was groundbreaking and earth shattering for many, many people. 
you're the one who started it all. Well, you know, that it's funny that you say that because you're speaking from a Mormon studies perspective, okay? Yes, from I an am. anthropology perspective, to write an article that shows DNA doesn't support the Book of Mormon narrative, I mean, come on, that's not that's not a story in anthropology. Are you uh, telling me that there are anthropologists out there who don't think that the Native Americans are descendant from Hebrews? They absolutely don't, right? And they don't. You don't even consider it as a possibility. Uh, <laughs> so what you're writing is like, yeah, why are you writing this? Everybody knows this. But within right, Mormonism, yeah. kaboom. Yeah, I was taking what, what is basic knowledge in Anthropology 101 and trying to share it with a, a Mormon audience. And that, you know, is pathbreaking in Mormon studies, maybe, or Book of Mormon studies, but not in anthropology. Uh, it was, you know, it was kind of mundane. Uh, but, you know, I it defined my career, though. You know, most people don't know about this early work, so I'm glad that you're bringing it up here uh, and allowing me to share a little bit of the story of how I traveled through that. But anyway, oh my gosh, I was over. I just want to tell you, I was over at a diner many, many, many years ago mm -hmm. at a local diner here in the small town where I I work. And a judge comes over and he sits down. We're talking. And he says, hey, what is this about DNA in the Book of Mormon? You don't believe that Book of Mormon's real history, do you? Yeah. Thank yeah. you for embarrassing me in front of a judge. That's all I can say. Professor. <laughs> yeah, well, it was probably on the news because <laughs> that that was a big story, right? And I like yes. I took that long break. It was nice, but eventually I, I found I, I, I during the Mitt Romney campaign I kind of felt like the story my work was unfinished and I had some work to come back to. And so about 2014 I started researching and writing on Mormonism again. Uh, and I told that story in Decolonizing Mormonism, so I won't I won't share it here. But uh, and on I think on Mormon stories, but instead we'll <laughs> talk a little bit about some of the scholarship on the Third Convention that's happened uh, in the meantime. I wanna mention a, a couple of books, uh, Primitive Religion and Just South of Zion. I think one of the people in the chat said, if you wanna hide something from Mormons, put it in a book, right? <laughs> uh, well, these are some great books on the third convention or that at least address the third convention as part of it. Uh, Jason Dormady, uh, who's at Central Washington University published Primitive Revolution and he looks at uh, restoration religion in the context of the Mexican Revolution uh, and uh, looks at Mormonism as one case study and the Third Convention as one case study compared to like La Luz del Mundo, another uh, large politically active uh, religious community in Mexico. Uh, and then uh, along with Jared uh, Tamez, uh, that he published a, an anthology called Just South of Zion. And that includes a group a couple of articles on the Third Convention, one by Dr. Elise, Elisa Polito and Dr. Stuart Parker. Uh, Elisa examines the role of women in the Third Convention, and Stuart uh, it provides a comparative intellectual history of Margarito Bautista and Jose Vasconcelos, who was a, a candidate for the Mexican presidency. So very fascinating uh, reads for those who might be interested in, in more. If you and go then, back to that slide, the slide yeah. right before this, because that said something that I was not familiar with. And that's yeah. under the, the Primitive Revolution book, where the synopsis says, conflicts over the creation of a new Jerusalem in the state of Mexico. Mm -hmm. Is that what they were doing? Is that what they feel they're doing is creating the new Jerusalem in Mexico? Oh, yeah, that's what they've done. OK, I didn't know that. So yeah, they don't think is. it's still in Missouri. No, it's in it's in Osumba. Well, is that pictures. temple then that you took a picture of? Is that the that's, temple? That's the New Jerusalem. That's not just a temple out there. That's the that's temple. The New Jerusalem. Yeah. I did not understand that until yeah. now. Yeah. So, pretty important. Yeah, and it's a great book on providing that context. And Elisa Polito would go on to complete a PhD in religions of North America at Claremont Graduate University. And she wrote a fascinating biography called The Spiritual Evolution of Margarito Bautista, Mexican Mormon Evangelizer, Polygamist, Dissident, and Utopian Founder, uh, that New Jerusalem again. Uh, and she does a really great job of placing Bautista and the Third Convention within a historical and cultural context of Central Mexico and Hispanic Utah. She did a lot of work on what was happening in, in Utah when 
uh, Bautista was in Utah. And I, I've drawn a little bit in my comments on some of her research, but I highly recommend it. And I interviewed uh, Dr. Polito for the Mormon History Association a, a year or two ago. And that interview is available on YouTube and on my academia page. And if you fought, if you listen to that interview at the end, uh, there's a discount code for the purchase of the book. So uh, that, again, I've shared these slides. They're on my academia page. So anybody can follow the hyperlinks if you joined our show late. And then I want to mention uh, one of the most exciting and prolific uh, of the scholars uh, working in this uh in this field, and this is Dr. Uh, Moroni uh, Spencer Hernandez de Alarte. And he's a pr history professor at the Universidad Autónoma de Mexico, or UNAM. And he's published widely, but mostly in Spanish, on the Mexican Revolution and Mormons, especially in the Osumba, Mecca Mecca, and Atlautla, or the volcanoes region uh, that was so central to the Third Convention. So he really places that Mexican Mormonism within a larger context, and particularly the connections with uh, the Mexican Revolution uh, and Zap uh, the Zapatistas uh, of the Mexican Revolution. Uh, so pictured here are some of his books, Osumba, Arte y Historia, Entre la Patria y el Pueblo, uh, Hechos y Nombres, La Tlautla en el Tiempo, Mujeres, Historias y Sociedades Latinoamérica. He actually asked me to write a chapter for that, and uh, I had to turn him down because I, my Spanish has gotten rusty and I didn't have time to go back to Mexico and finish the research, but uh, he wanted me to write on the women in that community in Osumba. And I had talked to a few of them, but that's about the extent of my research with women there. So I didn't have a lot to contribute. Uh, I'll and ask you this. Yeah. Up here in, uh, well, Utah, I'll just say in the United States, when you're dealing with fundamentalist groups, there are certainly different groups and they come in all stripes. But one of the more recognizable ones is where women dress in pioneer clothing. Did you see that among the women? In oh, the not at all. No, this is, this is more of the AUB. The AUB is very different. I'll just tell you a little. You know, so I, I, I show up in this community and, and, you know, and I get I get kind of shuffled around. Uh, I ask these kids, you know, if. Uh, if if they, were, if they knew anybody of Margarito Bautista and they just like said, wait a minute. And they went and asked a woman. I talked to this woman. She uh, asked her about uh, if she knew about Margarito Bautista. And she she said, uh, well, she's new in the community. So hang on. Let, the, the bishop's out of town. So maybe she'd get me the, uh, the counselor. So she took me over to the counselor's house. And uh, he invites me in. I introduce myself as an anthropologist interested in Margarito Bautista. And, uh, and uh, he asked me a lot of questions. Uh, and it becomes clear that I'd done a little bit of research. I understood a little bit of what was going on. Uh, and so he agreed to an interview. And then he offers me coffee. And I'm like, hmm, is this a test? <laughs> he said, or, or how about beer? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and <laughs> cerveza. And I'm like, uh, what's going on here? Uh, th this is a little different than uh, LDS uh, or FLDS uh, versions of, of, of fundamentalism. I mean, his wives are walking in and out of the room while we're talking, but he's offered me beer and coffee, which I declined. Uh, I didn't, you know, I wasn't quite <laughs> sure if they were testing me or what, but it turned out that they drank uh, beer and coffee, they actually read the, the word of wisdom literally. Uh, again, if you actually, if you actually read it, uh, then uh, it actually sanctions uh, the use of uh, drinking beer. Uh, it doesn't expi explicitly name coffee. It just talks about hot drinks, right? You were mentioning right, you said the, something there that, oh, great. Go ahead, Bill, because you, you got were mentioning the, the mode of dress or clothing. And just FYI, I mean, Cody Brown, the Sister Wives show, um, they're members of the Apostolic United Brethren. And I've been, you know, I've been around the Brown family a little bit because they've done stuff with Family Pawn and in some of their TV shows and hanging around them, they just look like an ordin other than the fact that there's one man and multiple women in a large family, um, dress-wise and home-wise and, and 
their environment, it just looks like normal America, you know? And so I'm like, as, as um, Professor Murphy is pointing out, to go down there, I would have expected the Mexican saints in the AUB to be just dressed like other Mexican citizens. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out, Bill. And Professor, you had said something, Professor, that brought a question to my mind because you said you talked to a kid, the kid took you to a woman, and she said she was new to the community. Mm -hmm. So how does a woman become new to the community in a polygamous uh, group in Mexico? I'm guessing that there's some kind of missionary effort that they take part in. Yeah, romance. Uh I mean, I, the women I did talk to were were mostly had married in to the community. And I asked one woman, I asked her, I said, well, so you were raised Catholic? And she said, yeah, I was raised Catholic. And I said, well, why would you want to become a Mormon? Uh, and she said, well, at least this way I know who my husband's sleeping with. Ooh. Uh, Zing. Was, <laughs> so they were recruited as wives, uh, the ones I talked to. So, I mean, I don't know about... Uh, you know, I can't speak, you know, there was no systematic study or anything, but the few women I talked to uh, were outsiders uh, that had married in and been recruited by the men in the community. I know that happens. Mm -hmm. I just always wonder how. Uh, charisma. Uh, yeah, that's why I don't understand it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, that, that, that was beyond my research. I wasn't really... There, Polygamy wasn't really the topic of my my interest. I was much more interested in the identity issues. Uh, and so, anyway, we're running we're running a little short on time, aren't we? Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I mean was technically, gonna... you've got twelve minutes until eight p.m., which is when we try to end. We yeah. want to take maybe a phone call or two, and folks, if you do want to call in six six two six six seven six 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 seven or six six two Mormons. But yeah, I mean, another five, maybe eight minutes or so, and then we'll take a couple of phone calls. Yeah, I, so I'm not going to read this, but Mar Maroni did a great analysis of uh, Mormonism in Mexico in the podcast. I find this strange, by the way. He pronounces his name Maroni. Yeah. Meanwhile, we as Mormons have the word Moroni, and that's how we pronounce it. And yet, this is well, just the Spanish. Yeah, the Spanish pronunciation. Yeah, yeah totally. Nephi, but anyway, he has a great. At the end of a word. A great article in the Paul Grave Handbook of Global Mormonism uh, that kind of places the Third Convention again in a larger perspective, uh, and I, you know, what I think is noteworthy. I won't read to his passage, but you have basically colonial versus decolonizing readings of the Book of Mormon happening. People are using the Book of Mormon to justify their the colonialism or white supremacy. Uh, over indigenous people versus the people that are reading the Book of Mormon to legitimate uh, indigenous leadership. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, uh, anyway, I encourage people to take a look at his work in the, the Palgrave Handbook of Global Mormonism. A couple of interesting things that have happened recently is that uh, Fernando and, and, and Enriqueta Gomez donated their, their Mormon Mexican history collection uh, that was previously housed at the museum to Claremont Graduate University. So it's now available to the public. Uh, and they CGU hosted a National Endowment for Humanities seminar this past summer that introduced a team of mostly young Chicano and Mormon studies scholars to the collection, including the documentary history of the Third Convention. Uh, and so this is a picture from that project. I was able to participate. They allowed me as that kind of the one old guy in the participants. And then Fernando and Enrique, Enriqueta was the old people in the presenters. Uh, but I, I will note, I mentioned earlier a couple of people that were participants in that, Stephanie Griswold, a, a graduate student at CGU, and, and Dr. Christina Rossetti, who's at Utah Tech. And they're producing new research on fundamentalist perspectives on Bautista and the Third Convention that I'm excited to see where they go with it. Another event of note was the uh, University of Utah hosted under the leadership of Farina King and Michael Ng. Uh, Farina King is uh, Diné, Michael Ng is uh, Native Hawaiian. Uh, and they they hosted an event this past summer on uh, reflections on discourses about Lamanites. Uh, and Ignacio Garcia, who used to be a professor at BYU, uh, gave a keynote address called My Search for a Lamanite Identity, the Mexican Revolution, Rama Mexican, Mexican uh, Magrito, Eduardo, Etzlan, and 
uh, the San Antonio Fourth Ward. That's available on YouTube. Uh, it's You can find it on the University of Utah's uh, Mormon Studies page or search for it on YouTube or follow the links in this slide. Uh, and I get another perspective on, uh, in, in a, a Chicano perspective on Margarita Bautista and the Third Convention. And then there was a panel discussion of which I was a participant and uh, as well that's available on, on YouTube. Uh, and what's important about this event is that the emphasis is now on indigenous perspectives on Lamanite identity, centering, centering indigenous voices uh, in the uh, in the work, and uh, that hasn't always uh, hasn't always been the the emphasis. Professor, I know that the church as a whole has basically distanced itself from any identification of any peoples as Lamanite. Has that trickled down to the Mexican saints themselves? Uh, that's, okay, that's a great question and I don't have a, like a, a scholarly answer. I do have a, and I know that the video I participated in, DNA versus the Book of Mormon, uh, that there is a, a Spanish version of that that's been widely distributed. Uh, and it has somebody doing a voiceover. There's a voice actor that plays me speaking Spanish. and. And he speaks Spanish much better than I do, but that has been shown widely in in Mexico. Uh, and but to say what the impact has been is kind of hard. I can say in this in this workshop that DNA was addressed, but it wasn't the primary issue. Uh, you know, there certainly there were some participants who found the DNA research liberating to uh, be able to focus on their own indigenous traditions and other people that found it troubling uh, in that it challenged their faith. Uh, and so there was a wide spectrum of perspectives, but most of the concern was not over the DNA, it was over representations of, of uh, Native Americans and not understanding Native perspectives or, you know, it's more about the, the ethnocentrism and racism in the church than about DNA. Because hmm. I, I would think that if I were a, uh let's say a Mexican is in this case, mm -hmm. and I'm a member of the church, and I read the Book of Mormon is giving primacy to me because I'm a Lamanite, that I would be less inclined to distance myself from that identification. I'd want to embrace it more in spite of what the church in Salt Lake City is saying, that we don't know who the Lamanites are. Yeah, so there's a big debate, and that's what's what's happening now. That group is you know, going to continue to meet and some of them are producing their own scholarship. So I, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. One of the most intriguing responses, though, has been the work by Jared Hickman. He wrote a, an article called The Book of Mormon as Amerindian Apocalypse in American Literature in, in 2014. Uh, and he basically does a literary analysis of the Book of Mormon, demonstrating a, a textual basis for the recurrent indigenous readings of the Book of Mormon that prophesy an apocalyptic collapse of settler society and the return of the land to indigenous communities are going to eventually lead a millennial restoration. Uh, and so he basically did a literary parallel to my ethnographic research that was showing these views quite common in indigenous Mormon communities. Right. Uh, and that can be found throughout the Book of Mormon. But once again, Jesus is the one who's talking about it. Yeah. You know, right. There's this yeah. Whole chapters in third Nephi that we never talk about in the church. We talk about Jesus showing up. We might make, give a reference to the Sermon on the Mount without calling it that. And then, you know, all the angels come down and they circle around the little kids and how beautiful it is. And then Jesus says, contention is of the devil. And then he's out of there. But there's whole chapters that we never talk about where Jesus is talking about the Lamanites in the last days rising up and basically being like a lion in the midst of the sheep mm -hmm. as far yeah. as the Gentiles, that they're going to lay waste to them and assume their rightful place as God's people. They're going to build the temple. They're going to build the new Jerusalem. If the Gentiles get their, their act together, sorry, this is a family show. Yeah. If the Gentiles get their act together and join Mormonism, then they can be part of it. They're not going to be destroyed, but it's still a secondary role that they will assume. Yeah, and, and Jared Hickman really kind of does a good job of placing that within the context of revolutionary prophetic movements that have gotten my attention uh, and, and some of my more recent research 
uh, in terms of that's a narrative that comes out of these indigenous prophetic movements of Tenskatawa, uh, or who was the brother of Tecumseh uh, during the War of 1812, which was occurring while Joseph Smith's a kid. Uh, and you have this narrative of uh, uh, taking the land back. But in Tenskatawa's uh, perspective, there was a place for some settlers, but a small group uh, that uh, would accept indigenous leadership. Okay. And so that narrative you see uh, it, in the Book of Mormon was a common 19th century trope. Uh, mm -hmm. And so Hickman does a good job of placing that perspective. There's kind of a counter argument, though, to Hickman, who sees a decolonizing potential in the Book of Mormon. And that's coming from a Dakota Latter day Saint, Elise Boxer. She wrote an article in the Amer Essays on American Indian Mormon History called The Book of Mormon as Mormon Settler Colonialism. And she's arguing, basically critiquing the way that the Book of Mormon justifies settler colonialism, justifies white supremacy, uh, and uh, has been read primarily by uh, Latter-day Saints uh, to uh, delegitimize indigenous histories and to legitimize the taking of native land uh, by settlers. Uh, and so that question is not resolved, but it's still present. And it's become a, a big part of my current research, which we talked about uh, a few months ago uh, on neophytes and Lamanites in the Book of Mormon. Uh, and those who haven't seen that episode might want to go back and, and watch Mormonism Live number 72. Uh, and uh, my argument that if one way to approach the Book of Mormon is to look at it within the context of neophyte narratives. And I use the term neophyte to describe native Christians and native prophetic movements. And that's how the term was used in the 19th century. Uh, and uh, anyway, that's where it kind of how this all kind of wraps back around uh, to my current research. And here's a couple of uh, the articles I've published that one science and fiction, Kennewick Man, the Ancient One and Latter-day Saint Discourse just appeared in Journal of Northwest Anthropology and an insufficient canon, the Popol Wu's Book of Mormon and other scriptures in Journal of Mormon History that brings my Popol Vu work in Guatemala up to date uh, in 2022. So in summary, uh, what we've what we've got uh, is the third convention and the underlying issues of ethnic representation and indigenous reception histories of the Book of Mormon that it invoked are still with us today. Uh, they were not resolved by unification in 1946. There are other stories that are not included in Tolis's foundational book on Mormons in Mexico and the, the Museum of Mormon History in Mexico and the scholars they have helped are adding important stories to the mix. El Reino de Dios in su plenitude, or that community and colonia industrial, remains a thriving reminder of Margarito Bautista and the brand of Mormonism that he represented. The remnants of the Third Convention simply did not wither away, as I'd been told in the early 1990s, but continued to grow while embracing a fullness of the Latter-day Gospel that includes the United Order, plural marriage, and apocalyptic readings of the Book of Mormon. And subsequent scholarship has begun to address the many stories of Mormonism in Mexico and indigenous perspectives on Lamanite identity. Important work has been launched by indigenous and Chicano scholars that I think is gonna shape the future of scholarship in Mormon studies. And a robust discussion of the Book of Mormon as either a settler colonial text and or a decolonizing narrative has just begun. And I think in the end, it's going to be the indigenous perspectives that are going to be most important in that discussion. Very basic question from here. And thank you so much for that summary, Professor. El Reino de Dios en su plenitud. What does that mean? That's the name of the church the, down there. The, yeah. the, uh, the kingdom of God in its fullness. Yeah. The Sorry. kingdom of God in its yeah, fullness? The kingdom of God in its fullness. Yeah. That's the name of their church. Yes. Okay. You, or New Jerusalem. You can use that. Do they use that? Nueva Jerusalem. Sa Sounds like they do. Yeah. And that's are, certainly. The, are they using it? Again, we're translating Spanish to English and something gets lost maybe. Is their interpretation to be New Jerusalem? Yes. Yeah. Zion, you know, that's what they're creating. 
And just FYI, there aren't any calls in the call bank. There are lots of people in the comments who said that they love this material. And in fact, one of the people said they'll have to go back and watch it again. Um, it's kind of a hard topic to jump into and try to ask a question about. But I'm curious, these two groups that you found, were both of them practicing polygamy or was one doing it and the other one wasn't? And do you know offhand what the population of the other group was as well? I, I did not visit the second group, and I only heard about it secondhand. Uh, my recollection is that, that they did polygamy too, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Uh, and It'd be interesting to I, see if My recollection is that other. they were a, a couple hundred. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I really, that that's work that's yet to be done. If I had gotten that funding and my career had taken a different path, maybe I would have done it. But it's... I, now, one of the reasons for me kind of putting this together in a slideshow and stuff is that maybe there's a scholar out there that wants to take this on because yeah. I think that there's a great project to be finished that I've only I only started. Like you pointed out, there were 800 people at the third convention. When the church wins some of them back, it, it wins. Was it like 800 out of 1200 or 1200 out of 1600? It was like it was like three quarters or two thirds of what they proposed were out there came back and and whatever was left was certainly less than 800 and now today you're saying like that's 800 maybe a thousand people it seems like at least one of these two groups is a thriving community as you're you know showing with pictures and other things other evidence that points to that yeah and certain i mean you know it pales in comparison i suppose to the lds church and it's you know million plus that they claim in Mexico. I don't remember what the census numbers are, but they're a fraction of what the church claims. Mm -hmm. uh, but, right. you know, I mean, it, there, it is definitely small in comparison, but uh, I, I think that it's quite significant. Yeah. Can I ask a question if nobody's on the line? Nobody. I, and, okay, I ended professor. the call thing just because we're close to the end and there weren't any calls. All right. This is going to call for your personal opinion here, Professor. But we've got a situation where the Book of Mormon and the question is about the Book of Mormon because it's being used by one group to support primacy of the Lamanite. Mm -hmm. And that's in the Book of Mormon. Right. Then there's another group that uses it to support primacy of non-Lamanite, white Gentiles, white Mormons, the ones who join the church. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's in there, too. What do you make of the Book of Mormon when it can be drawn upon, and I think legitimately, to support two absolutely different and conflicting points of view? Your thoughts? I, I think that there's there, there are multiple narratives. I think what what Joseph Smith, I, what I think he, he was really good at was kind of weaving together a variety of different ideas that were part of his cultural milieu and bringing them together into some sort of synthesis because there is a synthesis there as well in the sense another way of reading the book of mormon is that all are alike unto god right that all are equal uh, and that can be employed though by both of those sides and in fact in the case of the third convention uh that equality was used as justification for uh suppressing the third convention uh and it you know, from their perspective, they were they were advocating for equality, uh, but the church leaders would use the language of equality to basically uh, disempower uh, Lamanite leadership. That there that there's no difference they would say between Gentiles who are born in born into the covenant of Abraham versus those who are adopted. Uh, and and use that claim of equality to delegitimize those uh, interpretations of the Book of Mormon. And well, so I think the, the tricky thing about that um, verse in sec, Second Nephi chapter four, I think it is mm -hmm. about bond and free, male and female, yeah. black and white, all are alike unto God. That there's that pesky clause in there that says, "Yeah, you're all alike unto God if they come unto me." God speaking. So I think that if you're a party that identifies yourself as the one that's on the right side with God, then the other party has to come unto you, which is coming unto God, in order to be considered equal. And that could be employed regardless of which side you're on. 
Yeah, and I, I think it it you know it makes me suspicious of even those interpretations of the Book of Mormon because if you if you if you're claiming the Book of Mormon advocates equality, but you're in a hierarchical institution that privileges white male authority, uh, and you're using those passages of equality to justify your own leadership position, you're not really advocating equality. Uh, and I I think that that's you know. It's really a fundamental problem with the Book of Mormon. I think, you know, Dan Vogel and Brent Metcalf's work on the Book of Mormon kind of show how the Book of Mormon narrative, uh, when read through the priority of Mosiah, you don't see an intent to create a church in the latter days until late in the process. And so there are a lot of a big portion of the Book of Mormon that doesn't legitimize uh, the creation of a church like the LDS church. Uh, and then there are other passages that do, and it appears that Joseph Smith's objective changed uh, while he was uh, staring into that stone in a hat, uh, and his 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 goals changed, and so the narrative itself evolved uh, to reflect those those intentions, and so you you basically have competing narratives within the Book of Mormon itself. Yeah, what I see happening with that one verse that we're talking about is that the church sometimes that I have seen uses that verse to outwardly talk about equality and how we're always in favor of equality and we have been ever since the Book of Mormon came off the press. But just under the surface, what they're really saying is, as long as you come unto God, which means coming unto the church, which means doing everything that the church requires of you. And as long as you get baptized into the LDS church and are a faithful Mormon, then you're all equal before God. But that's yeah. what all bets are off. But, you know, the, the prophets in the Book of Mormon are not leaders of church. They're challenging uh, often religious authorities of the time, like Samuel the Lamanite. Uh, he's, he's not the president of the church, okay? Uh, he's a prophet that uh, exists parallel to uh, church leadership and is in fact challenging Nephite church leadership uh, for their failures. Uh, so, if, you know, I kind of think of it, you can read the Book of Mormon with Captain Moroni as your hero of the narrative, or you can read it as Samuel the Lamanite, the hero of the narrative. And you or get- the, Or the anti-Nephite Lehites. <laughs> yeah. And you get very different uh, interpretations depending on on how you center that those characters yeah can i just tell you that from my perspective that makes the book of mormon more complex and i respect it more as a work of literature than if it just went one note all the way through well and that's why i like to highlight jared hickman's work because he really does a good job of looking at it that way he he worked with liz fenton to do a book called americanist approaches uh, to the Book of Mormon that really kind of looks at the, the Book of Mormon within 19th century historical context. Uh, and it's a, basically a series of literary analysis of, of the text that are very informative. Uh, and it d does show that it's, it's, it is a complex narrative. Uh, and, and, you know, this experience of the third convention in Mexico just shows how divergent indigenous interpretations can be from those of, of settler colonial or white Mormons. The, the LDS church is lucky that good, faithful, believing Mormons don't take Mormonism too seriously. <laughs> because if they read their canonical scripture, if they read the quotes of leaders and really took them to be prophets, right? Mormonism has really done this good job of going like, once our leader dies, we throw him in the past and we don't really talk about him anymore. So members of the church really don't know anything about Harold B. Lee or George Albert Smith or, you know, name name 85% of them. The church, you know, average member of the church doesn't know anything about because the church very quickly moves on from dead prophets. Uh, and they selectively choose what verses we go over in Sunday school every year to the point where a good, faithful, believing Latter-day Saint, the majority of them, 95% of them, 
are essentially clueless to what their faith's history and sacred texts contain. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at the same time, considering themselves fully informed. Yes. What a good job the church has done pulling that one off. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Murphy. I keep on wanting to say Brother Murphy, but thank you, Professor Murphy, for uh, an incredible presentation. And I think this was a well-needed uh, side of the story that we left out as we tried to just cover the major historical events. And we really didn't know much. I didn't know much about these groups that had gone on and, and continued to exist and to some extent thrived. And you brought that to us. And I really appreciate that. Well, thanks for the invitation. And I do encourage people to watch both shows in, in tandem. Yeah. Yeah, they should go together. And um, I do do want to remind people that I, that a document that I used for the slideshow is available on my Academia author page. And you, it includes hyperlinks on all the photos and uh, quotations and citations. So you can dig deep if you'd like to do that. Yeah. And folks don't know, you know I reached out to you before we did the first episode two weeks ago and asked you for some information. I couldn't dive into everything, but you had shared all these things that I didn't quite utilize that I probably should have, but I just knew that I wanted to get the main story out and I didn't have enough time to do it. So in the time I invited you, I said, hey, two weeks from now, I want you to come back on and kind of fill in the voids and offer a different perspective, which you've done beautifully, um, but you've been super helpful. And then even late into the prep for that first show, you gave us a uh, the website you're mentioning, I think, I think it's the one you're mentioning, but it had tons of photos and old docs and stuff. And that was very useful because the photos I had were very limited, not that great. And to have Abel Paez, uh, to have Batista, to have uh, Isaiah Suarez, uh, better photos of those folks, uh, I think was deeply meaningful to the show as well. Yeah, and those are publicly available at Claremont Graduate University. Yeah. Yep. And I think those, uh, if people go to the first show where it's listed in the website, I'm not sure, so sure about YouTube, but at least if you go to mormonismlive.org and find that show, in its footnotes are the links to all the sources we use, as well as that Claremont, uh, Claremont uh, University uh, website with all the, the images. So, folks, I, I just want to say, Tom, just by the articles you put up on the screen, the help you were to me in preparing for the first one, you really are the expert on this topic. And uh, really appreciate the work you've done in this field. Thank you. Absolutely. And I don't, I think we should just scrap Brother Murphy and go straight to Father Murphy. Father Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, they used to call me in the army. <laughs> was it really? Yeah, because my daughter was born when I was in uh, basic training. So they called me Father Murphy. That's wow. great. Was the show on then? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which has its own Mormon connection. Right. Uh, you know, I, I grew up without a TV, though. So, I, I mean, I only loosely, I, I never really watched the show. I, I heard of it. But yeah, I, I never watched it, but I heard of it, too. Yeah. So if some of your quotations from movies and television shows go over my head, I... <laughs> Me, I didn't, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't grow up with that. Malia, I grew up kind of a really strict home where TV was like the Satan's realm. Love yes, it. it is. And I love it there. <laughs> Any Anything else from you, Professor Murphy, before we close it out? Uh, that's all. So thank you for the invitation. And, you know, just thanks to, uh, especially to Fernando and Enriqueta uh, Gomez and, uh, and all of the scholars that they've supported over the years uh, and the work that they've done. Awesome. Everybody, uh, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. We, uh, again, appreciate you so much being followers and fans of the show. Folks, if you want to donate, we would deeply appreciate it. We're getting towards the, the last part of the year where we really try to kind of finalize any donations we're going to get for the year. Go to mormonismlive.org, click the donate button. Uh, even just a few bucks a month makes a huge difference. Um, we would deeply appreciate that. Uh, RFM, anything else from you? Just to announce that next week, we're going to have Nemo. Ooh. Yes, Nemo on the show. And the title of the show is going to be something along the lines of Nemo versus the LDS Church. And spoiler alert, the LDS Church gets clobbered. Yeah, they're losing. <laughs> okay. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.